It's summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, it's very, very hot in the state of Georgia right now. So of course, when I drive my Tesla around, it's doing a whole lot of work to air condition the car and make the interior of the cabin cool enough that we can be in it without suffering too much. But in conversation with Tesla owners and people who just have air conditioning, etc., I realized that there's a big misunderstanding about what an air conditioner is, what a heat pump is, and why it's important that Tesla has heat pumps in its cars now rather than air conditioners. Let's take a look and find out. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I want to actually back up a little bit today and I want to talk about kind of working from first principles, what air conditioning is, how it actually operates. Tesla's heating and cooling system is actually rather complicated and I'll touch on it to some extent, but basically it's not just trying to deal with thermal management of the cabin, which is of course us and our comfort, but it's also trying to deal with thermal management for the batteries, which is really critical because of course, as batteries are used and as they charge up, they both of those times they produce a lot of heat in that process and so a lot of thermal management has to happen with that. And so I'm sure a lot of Tesla owners, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of the octo valve, etc. It has a big function in terms of how Teslas actually operate efficiently. But today I really want to focus more on kind of the primary principles of how a heat pump operates. And this actually holds true for your house as well. If you have a heat pump or even if you just have an air conditioner, it works like that in cooling mode. So I think this is actually going to be useful for people. But if you're really interested in how the octo valve works and how the heat pump specifically in a Tesla works, I can do another episode on that. But this one's going to be, you know, enough information just contained in this one particular area. So we're going to go kind of from first principles up and we're we're going to talk about how a heat pump actually operates. And then of course why it's so important that Tesla now has heat pumps rather than air conditioning and heating units in its cars. All right, so let's start with what heat actually is. There are three types of heat transfer. One is radiative and that is something you're probably familiar with just in the sense of you go outside and you look up at the sun and primarily what you're getting the heat from the sun is radiative. In other words, what it is is electromagnetic waves that go, you know, 140 that million kilometers or 93 million miles approximately and they go from the sun and they hit the earth. And so that's radiation. It's direct electromagnetic radiation that hits you. Same basic thing as, you know, x-rays or microwaves, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all just radiative stuff. It's just different frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's what we call infrared is what we feel as heat. And of course, light is what we see as light. But that's radiative heat transfer right there. And it's rather inefficient as it turns out. And this is actually something that matters a lot in space because in space to get rid of heat, from, um, you know, if you're on the International Space Station or something like that, to get rid of heat out of the ISS, there's no good way to do it because radiative heating and cooling is actually very, very inefficient. But anyway, that's the first kind that's from the sun. The second is conductive heat transfer. And this is something, of course, if you've ever burned your hand on like a cast iron skillet on the stove, you'll understand conductive heating. That's basically if you have a material like iron or metal or something like that, and you heat part of it, it conducts that heat to another portion of of that same object, right? So in other words, you're only heating the body of the skillet, but the handle will also get hot unless you have something on top of it to keep it from doing that. And you're stupid enough to put your hand on it. And then you're like, ow, I burned my hand, right? So that is conductive heating. Then the third type of heat is convective heat. And that's what we actually deal with most of the time. Convective heat is air transfer. So you've got molecules of air all around you right now. And those molecules move at different velocities, right? So some of them are moving fairly slowly and some of them are moving super super fast but most of them are kind of in the middle and what they do is one that moves like too fast it'll bump into another air molecule that's moving slower you know uh, statistically on average inside of a room and it will transfer some of its high velocity energy into the slower moving particle. That thing will speed up. The other one, of course, will slow down somewhat. And so therefore the air molecules will actually come into balance so that they're all within a relatively narrow range of velocities. And of course, anyone that's moving too slow will eventually get hit by something with higher energy, which will raise its energy. So eventually the air molecules in the room will all move, you know, like in a bell curve. So most of them are in a relative 
relative range of velocity. And what we feel as heat is simply those air molecules bouncing off of our skin, or to be more precise, the water molecules. So air contains water molecules in it, and those water molecules are particularly good at transferring heat. They have a high heat capacity. So a lot of what we feel, so if you go to the desert and they always go, it's a desert heat, it's a dry heat. When they're talking about that, they really are actually meaning that there are fewer water molecules in the atmosphere, in the air that's around you. And because there are fewer water molecules, there's less convective heat transfer to your body. So it actually does feel cooler in the desert, even if it's, you know, 40 degrees centigrade or something like that. If it's 40 degrees centigrade in Phoenix, Arizona versus 40 degrees centigrade in Atlanta, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia has a much, much higher relative humidity than does Phoenix, Arizona normally, it's going to feel cooler in Phoenix, Arizona because there are fewer water molecules. So anyway, water molecules in particular have a big effect on how we feel heat. And so relative humidities that go up will cause it to feel hotter because there's more convective heating going on with our skin. But basically it's just molecules of air, molecules of water, etc., that are floating around impacting our skin that makes us feel hot or cold or something. It's the velocity of those things. So if they're moving slower than the molecules, remember we've got molecules of skin in our skin, right? And molecules of blood, etc. If those are generally moving faster than the air molecules around them, when they hit, it's going to transfer energy away from your skin into those air molecules. And so it's going to make you feel cold because you're going to be losing energy to the environment. Whereas on the other hand, in the summertime, like it is in the Northern Hemisphere, the air molecules will tend to be hotter than your skin. In other words, they're going to have a higher velocity and they're going to hit your skin and they're going to transfer energy to your skin and your blood vessels, etc. And they will make you feel hot. And then you will sweat to try to evaporatively cool yourself. All right, so that's convective heat and that's what really matters. Convective heat is what we're dealing with with an air conditioner or a heat pump or pretty much any heating unit that you're used to. So the goal with convective cooling is to pass warmer air over cold something. These happen to be coils, and I'm sure you've all seen those little coils with the fins, etc. in a car, in your house, or whatever. You pass the air over those, those fins, over those coils, and you transfer some of the energy out of the cool liquid or whatever's inside of those coils to the air. So, so, so the actual liquid inside of these coils heats up, the air cools down, and then you blow that out with a fan. And of course, you blow it into your room or into your car or whatever, and that area gets cooler. And then of course, the opposite happens with heating. With heating, you take something warmer than the ambient air. So you blow cooler air, which has lower velocities, remember. You have a warmer liquid. You blow it over those coils again. There's an energy transfer from this warmer liquid to the cooler air, which is going to increase the velocity of those air molecules. You then blow that into the cabin of your car or your house and it feels warmer. And interestingly enough, this actually tails into a 19th century physicist, Maxwell, who thought of Maxwell's demon as a, a little entity demon, not as in like an evil demon, even though that's the picture I could find. But anyway, so he's like a little creature that sits there and he looks around in a room, right? So imagine you've got a room that's divided in half and it's got equal amounts of like, you know, some high velocity air molecules, some low velocity air molecules. And what it does is it has a little gate and it opens and closes that gate. Whenever it sees like a low velocity air molecule in the room this side, my right hand room, it'll allow it through when it gets by there. And when it sees a high velocity one in my left hand room, it allows that through, but it blocks it off when other ones are going. And what's going to happen over time is that the two rooms will go out of equilibrium, right? So they started off at the same temperature, which is the same velocity, generalized velocity of the particles. But by separating out these particles, you eventually get a bunch of slower moving ones or cooler air in the my left hand room and you get faster moving particles of air or higher temperature in the right hand one. And that is a really fascinating thing. You can disequilibrium this without any work. So this actually created a bit of a conundrum in the 19th century about entropy because the second law of thermodynamics, which is that entropy always has to increase, was confused by this whole thing, right? He was saying basically no work would happen. Yeah, I know it has to open and close a gate, but whatever. So assuming that there's no actual work going on, what is happening? Well, it turns out in the world of physics that information is entropy. And that is a very, very important aspect of physics. 
and we're not going to get into that today because it's way too far afield, but I'd be happy to do an episode on that as well. It's a fascinating thing. But anyway, the idea here is, you know, to do Maxwell's Demon is to separate out the cold air from the hot air. And what you do is that when you're cooling something, you want to separate the cold air for the interior of your car's cabin or the interior of your house or something like that. And you move the hot air to the outside world, to the rest of the universe, and you exhaust it, right? So that's what you're doing. And then obviously the opposite happens when you're heating. You're moving the warmer high velocity air molecules into the cabin of your car or into the interior of your house and you're exhausting the cold into the universe outside. So anyway that's the setup. So how does a heat pump actually work? Well Carrier happens to have a really good picture of this which is quite simple and explanatory so I'm going to put that up and talk our way through it. And of course I'll put a link to their article in the description so you can look at it if you're interested. So let's start on the left hand side of this image. So if you look at that indoor coil right before that is is a little green arrow that's pointing to the left. So what we've got is we've got the flow of fluid. In this case, it's Freon or something along those lines. And the reason why we use Freon in such a case is because Freon just happens to have good properties. It happens to boil at around room temperature or 20 degrees centigrade, and it happens to recondense there. So it's actually a pretty good fluid for that. And it also has a high thermal capacity, etc. You could do the exact same thing with water boiling into steam, but the temperature of your house would have to be above 100 degrees centigrade. So, you know, that would be a bit of a problem. You would have to live in a place that was hotter than boiling water in order for this to work. But it would work with water too. So if it's easier for you to imagine this, you can imagine this with water. But Freon just happens to be the same thing as water, but it boils around room temperature. So it's much better for us humans. And also it doesn't really interact with the pipes and things like that. So it doesn't corrode the pipes it's in and everything. Now it does happen to be a terrible greenhouse gas. And that was something that we all discovered in the 1970s and 80s, so oopsie. So, you know, they're still looking for other compounds that can actually do as well as Freon, but it turns out Freon is really, really good at doing this job. So the basic deal is to keep these systems as closed as possible and not release Freon into the atmosphere as much as possible. But that's why we use Freon. It's just because it happens to have really good heating and cooling properties right around the temperatures that we are comfortable with. So anyway, back to this image, the indoor coil, right? So that's the thing that has all the little fins on it that I'm sure you've seen if you've looked at any air conditioner system or anything like that. And by the way, the heat pump in the cooling mode is exactly like an air conditioner. So this actually, will tell you how an air conditioner works. There's a reversal process that happens for the heating mode, and we'll get to that in a minute. But in the air conditioning mode, it operates like an air conditioner, so it's relatively easy to transfer these from one to the other. All right, so anyway, we have a cool liquid that passes through these grid fins, which have a lot of contact with the air. And remember, air molecules are moving around, they're bouncing around, and they're transferring energy back and forth to this coil. So what we're going to do is with that indoor fan, we're going to blow warm air over this coil. And as we blow this warm air, so let's say that, you know, you're trying to cool your, the temperature of your house to like 22 degrees centigrade or something like 74 degrees Fahrenheit. So what happens is the temperature of that liquid inside the coil is lower than 22 degrees centigrade. And so you've got higher, let's say it's 25 degrees centigrade inside the house. You blow 25 degrees centigrade air over this coil energy is transferred to the liquid inside the coil and it's removed from the atmosphere, from the air molecules, and so that effectively cools the air molecules down. And just remember again that what I mean by cooling it down is you're lowering the overall velocity of the air molecules in the room, right? So they're moving around like this, and by passing them over and passing energy into this coil, they're now moving around like this, so they're slower, right? A huge exaggeration. But that's kind of what happens here. So again, the way that I'm feeling temperature is just little molecules of air and water bouncing off of my skin. So we're just reducing the velocity of those air molecules, that's all we're doing here. And we're putting that energy, we're transferring it, right? Because the energy is conserved, we're transferring that energy into this liquid. And what's going to happen is as we transfer that energy into the liquid, the liquid will evaporate and turn into gas. So if we looked at the top left of the image here, we can see that we've got an evaporation cycle. So essentially the liquid that we had at the beginning of the coil turns into gas by the end of the coil. It's, it's absorbed a whole bunch of energy. So again, you can imagine something like, like water, right? You're boiling it. It takes energy to boil that water. So we're boiling that water, but we're boiling Freon, which just so happens to boil around 20 degrees centigrade. And we're doing that and we're absorbing energy and it's being transferred to turning this thing into gas. And that's how this all works. 
It's a simple energy transfer that's going on. Thus far, we really haven't had to do much work, right? We have a fan that's blowing and we have to circulate the Freon through the system, but really there's not a lot of work that's going on. The next step is where all of the work and why your air conditioning units at your house burn so much energy during the summer, and that is the compressor cycle. So what happens in the compressor cycle, which is the middle top of the image? We've got a relatively low pressure gas coming in from the left, which is the blue. It compresses it, in other words, it squeezes that and it turns turns it into a very high pressure gas. And as you might or might not know, compressing gas causes it to heat up. It's the opposite thing. I don't know if you've ever used like a spray paint can or something like that, but you know, you shake it up and you spray it and it'll start to feel really cold on your hand because what happens is, just because the faster moving molecules are gonna get out of the can faster, you're effectively cooling the can down. The velocity of the molecules inside decreases. Opposite thing happens when you squish air and you, you compress that air, you're doing work on that air and you're increasing the velocity of that air so the temperature goes up. So it becomes a very, very hot gas. So now we've gone through the compressor stage, which takes a huge amount of work, right? So a lot of electricity. And then we have a very, very hot gas. And now what we're gonna do is basically the exact opposite. We're gonna pass that really hot gas. So again, let's say the outside temperature is like 30 degrees centigrade, but this hot gas inside of this Freon pipe is like 40 degrees centigrade. So the outside air, even even though it feels warm to us, is going to be very, very cool compared to that Freon. So as we blow air over that hot gas, it's going to condense down into a cooler liquid. We will, of course, transfer a great deal of heat energy to the outside atmosphere. And that's, of course, why if you stand next to the outside part of a heat pump or the outside part of an air conditioner and you put your hand up, it's blowing out really, really hot air. It's because it's that energy transfer from the hot gas, the hot Freon, it's cooling that Freon down into a cooler liquid. It's still a little bit warm but it's fairly cool now, but it's transferring all of that heat energy, again, the velocity of the air molecules into the atmosphere and exhausting it into the universe outside. So anyway, now we've gotten down to the bottom right of this image, which is the condensation part of that image. So as it goes through those little fins, it condenses out and becomes a liquid again. And then finally we get to what's called the expansion valve. And the expansion valve is just a way of releasing pressure. So this is the same thing as opening up like a soda can. So basically you've got this liquid that's still under under some pressure, but what you're going to do is release that pressure. You're expanding it back out again, and that expansion causes it to cool down very, very rapidly. So now we go from a warm liquid, right? It's condensed, but it's still pretty warm, but by expanding it out, it cools down. So it's the opposite of the compressor cycle, right? But this doesn't take any real work. You just open up a valve, basically, and it expands out and it gets cooler. And now it's cool and it's ready to go back and start the whole cycle again, right? It's ready to receive energy from the atmosphere as you blow warmer air over it inside the house and then it spins around and it goes back through the compressor and it goes back through the evaporative part on the outside and it goes back through the expansion cycle, etc., etc. So that's how a heat pump works in air conditioning mode. The cool part about a heat pump is it's completely reversible. So what you can do is basically just switch the flow around and so you change the condensation part to the outside. So now your outside atmosphere maybe is like five degrees centigrade or like 40 degrees Fahrenheit and you're inside you're trying to keep it like 20 degrees centigrade or like 68, 70 degrees Fahrenheit or something, right? But what you can do is you can steal some of the fast moving particles of the outside air to cause the Freon liquid to evaporate outside. It evaporates and therefore it builds up a whole bunch of heat and then you pass that heat into the inside where it condenses and it transfers the heat as it's condensing, it's losing energy, it's condensing back into a liquid again. It transfers the energy into the interior of your house or into the interior cabin of your car or something, right? So now you've got a, a symmetrical system that goes back and forth. Now the problem with all of this comes about when you get too big of a temperature differential between the inside and the outside. Usually this happens in cold weather. So basically a heat pump stops being very effective around zero degrees centigrade or around freezing or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Below that it gets less and less efficient because it's trying to pump energy across too high of a gradient. So in Georgia where I live, where the temperatures don't get below freezing often, you know, they do at night a little bit, etc. but it's not that big of a deal. So a heat pump is a really ideal solution here. If you live in the Arctic Circle, you know, in like Norway or something where it's consistently below freezing for a large chunk of the year, you're going to want something like a gas furnace or coal or oil or something like that. It's much more efficient
efficient in those cases. But for us in these more moderate climates, heat pumps are actually really, really useful. And as it turns out, the heat pump, of course, for the Tesla is super, super useful too, because Teslas don't have internal combustion, right? A traditional ICE car or internal combustion engine car, what it does is if it's winter time and you want to heat your car up and you know it takes forever to heat your car up in the winter, because what has to happen is the engine has to turn over and it has to generate a bunch of heat and then you pass air, you exchange heat from the engine itself over something, right, a heat exchanger, and then you pump that into the cabin. So eventually the cabin will become warm. Well, an electric car has to use resistive heating if it doesn't have a heat pump. And resistive heating is just exactly what you imagine. It's just a very big resistor. So it's like one of those little things that glows red, right? And you pass air over that and it gets warm inside. But that is incredibly energy inefficient. It, it sucks a huge amount of battery power down. That's not what you want to do. Whereas a heat pump can be, I think, up to five times more efficient in terms of heating than a resistive heater. So in air conditioning mode, a heat pump doesn't really save all that much. It's, you know, it's basically the same thing as an air conditioner. But what you get is you get that reverse cycle where you're able to take heat out of the atmosphere and pump it into the interior of the cabin rather than having to use a resistive heater. And of course, as an added bonus, Tesla batteries produce a lot of heat as they're being utilized, right? So as you're driving it, they're generating heat. So you can pull that. There's a liquid cooling system in the battery compartment. You can pull that heat and using the octo valve in a very clever way, you can actually heat exchange some of the heat off the batteries and help to heat the interior of your car's cabin as well. So you can use the heat pump in combination with a heat exchanger, which causes all of this to work even more efficiently. So it's really amazing. The technology behind how all of this works, and especially in a Tesla, is just amazing. And if you look at how small the Tesla heat pump is compared to ICE cars, just their air conditioning units, it's remarkable how compressed they've got all of this stuff. It's really just amazing. So anyway, there's a huge amount of engineering that goes into this, but this episode was mostly just to talk about in principle how all of this works. And I hope this has helped to explain, you know, even if it just helps to explain how your air conditioner or your heat pump in your house works, hopefully that's useful. But it's also really amazing to see how Tesla has miniaturized everything, right? If you look at your house's heat pump, those outside units are just these huge things. And then you have an inside blower unit. So you've got the two symmetrical things, but you've got these two massive units in your house. And Tesla squished that all down to, you know, the size of like a can or something. It's maybe like two two liter cans worth of a volume or something. So it's really amazing. Anyway, it's so cool how Tesla's done all this stuff. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and informative. If you did, definitely like the video so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. You all are wonderful. I really, really appreciate your help and your support. Thank you so much. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200 and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which now has physics is the law. Everything else is a recommendation, which is a quote by Elon Musk, as well as other t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, etc, etc. Check it out in the description. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping helps out the channel. And as always, feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.